Hey everyone, welcome to Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast. This podcast is all about farmer's markets, how to increase your market business success while providing people with fresh food. Farmer's markets are essential. Whether you're a farmer's market manager or a small farmer or food maker selling at farmer's markets, you have found just the right podcast. This week we're chatting with Amanda Cross, Programs Manager for the Oregon Farmer's Market Association, about applying for grants for your farmer's market. Hey everyone, I'm one of your hosts, Bridget Myers. I'm a longtime Farmer's Market Manager and Education Coordinator at Farmer's Market Pros. And I'm Kat Fields-White, Director of San Diego Markets, still an active Farmer's Market Manager and Market Consultant, Founder of Farmer's Market Pros, and host of the Farmer's Market Pros community. And I'm Justine Marzoni-Mead, Tent Talk Producer and Marketing Director for Farmer's Market Pros. Today's episode of Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast, is supported by Grapevine Local Food Marketing. As farmers, food makers, and market managers, you've got a lot on your plate. Partner with Grapevine, and they'll take a big bite out of your marketing to-do list with website design, email automations, advertising, and graphic design. Their grant application support division provides materials to document the marketing portion of your value-added producer grant. Serving local farms, food councils, and local food initiatives across the U.S. and Canada, Grapevine is your one-stop shop for all your business's marketing needs. Find more information on how to get support for your market, farm, or food business by clicking the Grapevine Local Food Marketing logo on the resource page at FarmersMarketPros.com. Welcome back to Tent Talk. Today, our guest is Amanda Cross, Programs Manager for the Oregon Farmers Market Association. Amanda has been working in and around farmers markets for 12 years, first in Minneapolis and then at markets in Seattle, Washington, and Portland, Oregon. She joined OFMA in 2019 to support Oregon Farmers Market Managers, coordinating OFMA's Farmers Market Learning Network, and providing technical assistance to markets needing guidance and offering EBT and SNAP programs. Welcome to Tent Talk, Amanda. Hi, thank you for having me. So excited to talk to you. Sounds like you do a lot of really awesome things that our listeners are always asking us about, so (laughs) excited to have you tell them what to do. Um, If you could just kind of tell us a little uh, briefly, like about your personal and professional background, and how did how you got involved with farmers markets to begin with? Oh yeah, I um, well, I was doing like organic farm school at the University of Minnesota, and got, and was a vendor at the on at the farmers market on campus for a little while. That was my first experience being in. Besides, like I did like shop at them sometimes growing up, um, but that was my first experience like being involved in one was being a vendor with the. Um, student farm school stuff. And um, then later when I moved to Seattle, um, I still kind of wanted to be involved with farms. I was thinking about being on a farm or working on a farm or having a farm or I don't know what, Um, but I was living in the city and that wasn't really available to me as a direction. And my neighborhood was hiring for um, an intern to work at their farmer's market. And so I thought, well, that'll keep me kind of connected. And uh, so I started working there And um, then, uh, you know, there was some changes. And then the next year I was market manager somehow, went from intern to market manager. (laughs) Got a good promotion. Yeah, it all happened so fast. It happens. (laughs) Uh, So like I had, so I feel like I had a lot of experience going into being a market manager compared to some market managers having like a year of interning. A lot of market managers just kind of end up in the job with no experience. Um, and I did that for a couple of years, then moved to Portland and kept doing the farmer's market thing, worked at the Montevilla farmer's market there. And uh, yeah, I just, I don't know, the farmer just got kind of stuck in the farmer's market. I like farmers. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. Not that, stuck, you got yeah. woven into the fabric of the farmer's market. Oh, that's the a Montevilla nice market. euphemism. That's a nice way to say it, yes. <laughs> nice. um, so then how did you transition from that role with the markets um, to kind of supporting on an organizational level? Level. Yeah, well, um, you know, maybe like after many years of being a market manager, I might have been feeling just a little burnt out maybe. <laughs> and was kind of You're looking the first up. one that's ever happened. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nobody else has ever felt that way. <laughs> yeah, I can't relate to the feeling. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I was looking around and um, – I was looking in a variety of directions, but it happened that Ofma was hiring for this cool looking position um, of starting up their, a program that they had gotten an FMPP grant for um, uh, basically a 
research and training program for a small cohort of farmers markets and um, provide. And I was just really intrigued by this idea of providing a bunch of support for the people that work in farmers markets, because that was kind of what I was looking for as a market manager. And um, yeah, just kind of jumped at the chance to be a part of that. That's awesome. Um, how many markets are members of the Oregon Farmers Market Association? Oh, uh, I think we're at like 80 something markets are members. There's b- basically about 130 farmers market locations in Oregon um, run by about 107 organizations. Some markets, some organizations obviously have more locations than just one market. Wow. So that's a good sized group. Mm-hmm. Um, what size markets participate? Is it like mainly larger markets, really small, like rural markets? Is it a mix? Yeah, total mix. We have markets that are like, you know, we have the micro category of like two to five vendors all the way to a hundred plus vendors. I love that. It's probably really helpful for all the members to be in a group with kind of a mixed group like that. I felt that that is more helpful than just being with people that are your size. You can kind of learn from all angles. Um, Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So you guys have uh, many people participating. sounds like a really active, wonderful group. Uh, Can you tell us about some of the work that OFMA does on behalf of markets in Oregon? Like what is the stuff that you guys are doing as a uh, market organization? Yeah, so um, I think we provide a really exciting um, training and networking opportunities for people who run farmers markets. So that's not just staff, but also we try to get board members involved. Um, uh, Kat knows all of you guys know about that because you guys are doing part of our track of um, workshop series for this three year period, all about um, supporting vendors, supporting new vendors, especially. Um, Our other focuses on training are around um, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, marketing and promotions, and um, organizational development. So helping boards do their best work to support farmers markets. Um, But other things we do, um, we really try to provide that connecting space for markets, especially people who work for rural farmers markets. If they're the only ones, they might be the only farmers market in town. There's no one. There's no other market managers to talk to out there. So we're really trying to get um, market staff and board members across the state together in the same room so that they can share their expertise with each other. They really they know best how to do what they're doing and um, talking to each other about the crazy things that happen at market (laughs) is really supportive and um, good way for like especially new people to learn. Oh, yeah, that, you know. That is a thing that happens at farmers markets. It's not something that's unique to me. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, yeah just it's always having great a- to hear people have that. Amanda, does your group do any sort of general advocacy work or do you consolidate EBT SNAP, you know, um, equipment requests, that kind of thing? Do you do some of those things that are not – the networking is so critically important, but are you also doing some things that really can only be done at an organizational level? Yes. Um, yeah, we do do the, um, SNAP and EBT um, in Oregon, we're kind of lucky because we have this sister organization, Double Up Food Bucks, or Farmers Market Fund, that does the Double Up Food Bucks. And so OFMA's role is more in helping markets get started with SNAP and get them going so that then they can do the incentive, or we help them with any problems that they're having with their SNAP program so that they can keep doing Double Up Food Bucks. Um, we also, yeah, we do a ton of advocacy and promotion and having some of those higher level contacts with like the Oregon Department of Agriculture and um, our state legislators, the Oregon Health Authority, those kinds of things, especially during COVID when they would come up with these rules. We'd be like, no, that doesn't work for farmers markets or like clarify what you mean by that. We need to like we were the ones um, yeah, trying to help make sure that the farmer's markets stay open during the pandemic and making sure that those rules worked for farmer's markets. Um, Of course, we do things like providing a market directory. Um, We do a yearly census of the farmer's markets, which mainly is to get a count of all the markets, but also we ask a ton of other questions to like get a pulse on how they're doing and what they're thinking about and report all that info back to them. Awesome. That's great. All those little technical things that need to get done, I feel like. And if you're just one market manager, that's one voice. But if you're a collection and a group 
of people who are working in the market space. It's just can make it that much louder and that much more effective. So like we always say about these farmers market associations, it's just so important to kind of get involved and have collective voices be heard. Because as you said, it can be like a little isolating, especially if you're the only market in town. So (laughs) you might feel like your voice doesn't count, but it certainly does. And grouping together can help that for sure. Um, What kind of specifically does your role at OFMA entail? Like, what are you doing as director there? Yeah, so my thing is like, I'm, yeah, mainly running all of our trainings and workshops and the networking. I really want to, I build the relationships with the trainers and partnering with them to provide our workshop series. Um, You guys are like the easy ones because you guys run farmers markets. I can basically be like, come and do some workshops with us and like, tell us, tell, help support our markets with their vendors. But some of our other trainers, like they're good at their subject Um, But they don't know farmers markets like in depth or how what they're doing applies to farmers markets or why we're interested in them talking about that subject. So I I do a little more like developing the trainings that they are doing um, with our farmers markets. Um, We also have this um, smaller 10 market cohort that we're doing a bunch of research with collecting weekly sales data and customer counts and um, doing some neat market projects with them this year. Um, And we work with this, we have this wonderful partner, Dr. Mallory Ray at the, um, she's an extension professor and she does a bunch of our like data analysis and reporting back what we're learning from that. Um, uh, Let's see what else. I also, OFMA has a diversity equity inclusion committee and I staff that and we're doing a lot of good work and I'm really grateful for um, OFMA moving in that direction. It's changed a lot of, it's changing the way we're working in important ways. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Well, um, it's so fun to talk to you, especially hearing about kind of these more like research focused programs that OFMA is running, because a lot of the data that's coming out of that will be helpful for future grants. And that is what we wanted to kind of pick your brain about today. Um You'll, if you're in the farmer's market world, you'll probably hear that you, the USDA FMPP applications are due May 2nd, 2023 at 11.59 p.m. Set your calendars if they're not already. Um, and Eastern this, time. Eastern time, <laughs> not Pacific time, <laughs> like us here folks on the West Coast. Um, but it's funny that, you know, this application falls at that time because for those operating seasonal markets, that's right around the time that your markets are probably opening for the year. Um, and since it's such a busy season, we want to give our listeners some like really nitty gritty tips about what it takes to get prepared for applying for a grant because it's kind of not a casual thing. Um, it's something that if you want to do, you do have to, you know, really set aside some time. So we're hoping that Amanda can kind of fill us in on like what that takes. Um, so sorry, that was a long preamble. But um, so if you're a person looking for a grant, like what should what should you be looking for when you're, um, you know, shopping around for these grant opportunities? Like, how do you know if something might be a good fit for you or that you're the best fit for that grant? Like, what goes through that initial process of looking for these opportunities? Yeah, um, that's a good, really good, important question. Um, I do want to start, though, by saying that, like, everything I'm about to tell you, I learned from Kelly Crane, who was the executive director when I was working here at Offman when I was hired. She taught me so much about FMPP grants, and she has done a bunch of them, and they've all been funded. And um, you should have hear her here talking about those. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, let's see. Starting with tips, I mean, I would say, first of all, probably if you were trying to apply this year, you probably should have started thinking about this last fall. Um, OFMA is going to plan to apply again. We're going to be applying next year. We're prob- we have already got on our calendar to start talking about our next FMPP proposal starting end of August is our first meeting on that. Um, they just take a really long time to put together. Um, but that said, <laughs> you can start trying right now. Um, I think it's a good idea to look at, oh, wait, I just remember you had a specific question. How do you know which is the right, um, which is the right one for you? Um, so don't try to come up with work 
that just to fit a grant, look at what you're already doing and figure out how to say it in the language that they are looking for. Don't change who you are. <laughs> don't don't add new projects and new work that you don't actually have um, capacity and staff and systems set up for. Um, think about what you're doing and and how does how does it apply to what what this granting agency is looking for already. Really that sounds like really, really good advice. And also, you know, even though this is already such an ambitious thing to do, it sounds like a huge time saver. If you're like trying to invent a new program just to like fit the parameters of the grant, that's going to be so much more work than if you just are like, hey, we're already doing this thing. Now I just need to explain it in the language that fits the grant, you know, application. Um, okay, so you answered another one of our questions. How much time should you expect to spend on the applications? It sounds like if you're really planning ahead and giving yourself the time you need, you need like six months. Yeah, I think um, because yeah, because you there's a bunch of people, other people that you need to bring into this. They really, especially FMPP grants, they want to see that you are collaborating with other people in your community, and so there's a lot of people you need to pull in and talk to and get the, get them on board and how they're going to be a part of it and get, um, you have to include a bunch of partner letters saying how those people are going to be involved. And that's the part that you can't control. <laughs> like you want to start on that side, get all your partner letters in, get all of that lined up. Um, uh, Cause you can be working on your narrative to the very, that 1159 Eastern time, you can work on it up until then. Um, you have control over when you turn in that, but getting your partners um, squared away, you want to do that early. Yeah. So in addition to like getting, there's there's lots of people involved. Um, what are some of the skills required? Like, do you need an accountant? Do you need a financial expert? Like, beside the, the other people that are going to help you like implement this program, which Kat's going to talk more about in a bit, but like, who else do you need to tap for um, this application process? Oh, you mean like which of those skills are helpful in writing the grant or who do you want to have with you afterwards? Yeah, or? more when you're writing the grant. So you've got to, you know, typically you've got to submit a budget that shows how those funds are going to be expended and, and all mm -hmm. of that. Do you need your HR or payroll person involved? Do you need your accountant to give you numbers or is that something that you can usually come up with? Oh, sure. I mean, if you have those people, why not bring in their expertise? <laughs> but what I'm guessing is, is that most people don't have, like, we're like Oregon Farmers Markets Association. We don't, we're three part-time people. We don't have a budget and fundraising department. We just do it on our own. Um, so, yes, it is possible to put these grants together without those, like, special expertise people on your team already. Um, but I, one of the things that I thought was that we did with our grant was we did do like a mock, mock trial ver when we had it all written, we gave it to other people to look at and give their opinion. And how did we set this up? And we, um, we asked other associations and other people who had written these grants before to see their applications. Um, if anybody wants to see Ofma's applications, I'm happy to share them with people. I think, um, it's really good to see someone else's um, structure and how they did it and, and copy that. <laughs> great. That's, that's great and super helpful. And another reason why if you start early, then you can, you know, reach out to other people that, you know, that have successfully, you know, become the recipients of grants and you can get a little bit more advice. You can get some edits and whatnot. Oh, and in that realm is, um, the FM, FMPP also needs people to review these grants every year. And so a good way to get some experience and see how the, um, how that, how the applications are reviewed and the criteria that they use is to actually be a reviewer yourself. So if you're thinking of applying like next year, or the year later, you should try to get on this year's review committee. You also get paid to do it. So. Oh, heck so, yeah. 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 That's, a great, that's a great way to figure it all out because this is kind of can seem really overwhelming, I think, to yeah. a lot of people that haven't done any work with grants. So that's a great way to kind of take a look and get more comfortable with it so you can be ready to do your own 
Yeah. When well, you get to see so many applications in that process, and then you get to see which ones they approve, mm-hmm. so you get a sense of you know kind of the rhythm of oh this seems to kind of turn them off, and they'll they'll shove that back, and this seems to impress them, and they're inclined to move it on to the next review process. So yeah, yeah. I, really good insight. And you can see how many are turned in at eleven fifty nine p.m. That's yeah. right, <laughs> <laughs> all of them. <laughs> One thing about that I learned from being on the review committee is that there are so many different opinions of what makes a good grant. I mean, I came into it being like, we did our grant to the nines. We had so many attachments. (laughs) We provided so much background information. Um, We had a whole table of contents with all the extra stuff that we gave. And um, somebody else that I was on my review committee was like, when I told her about what our application, she was like, oh no, I would have not allowed you. I would have given you nothing for that like you wouldn't she was like if you can't write your grant in the 30 pages or whatever if you can't be succinct I don't believe that you're able to um carefully organize what you're doing if you need that much space you're you're like out of control and I was like wow really different opinion on 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 how this should look and work and what's successful and what shows that you know what you're doing and so I to me it just I came away with Stay true to yourself when you're writing these grants. Be who you are. Don't don't try to change your program. Interesting. Hmm. So a little bit more about the grant that Ofma received. Um, was your is your current grant subject to the twenty five percent match required now for FMPP grants? Okay. Yes. Amanda's nodding her head. Yes. <laughs> um, how challenging it? How challenging was it for you guys to find those matching funds? And like, what was that process like? Yeah, this is again where I can totally thank Kelly Crane for <laughs> all the social capital and um, fundraising support she had done for several years at Ofma, and we have a really good relationship by that time with the Ford Family Foundation, um, and that it, that's an that's an Oregon foundation, not the big famous one in New York, by the way. Um, and they had been our partner match on our previous FMPP and had, there was a lot of trust built up there. And so going into this new one, we were able to say, um, you know, we're going for another one of these FMPP grants. We can't do it without saying that we have your, um, you coming in as a match. Do you want to go in for it again? And, um, they wanted to see our project keep going and succeed. And they said, yes, but like, that match is such a barrier. I, I would love to see it go away. I I think it's really hard for smaller organizations or an individual farmer's market or a farm to find that. Um, I want to recommend doing, if you can't find like the cash type of match to really think about your in-kind. We did a lot of in-kind along with the cash match. Um, and And... Yeah, you have to be really creative. That's another, that would be a good thing to reach out to people who have done these grants about like, how did you figure out that match? How did you make those relationships? How did you do in kind? We need in kind ideas. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We um, we actually worked with Othma to provide registration for all the members of their cohort as an in kind. So we oh. provided that as, as because we were going in as a technical advisor anyway, we knew we were going to be involved with these folks. So that was a nice way to kind of build on to their match. And what Kelly's saying is so true. And it's something that Farmers Market Coalition has kind of added to their policy advocacy goals is to at least create some portion of grants that don't require that big match because it's very self-selecting. It means that small organizations, yeah. little bitty markets, emerging markets, oftentimes markets managed by people of color who may not have the social capital, as, as Kelly describes it, those long-term fundraising relationships, it basically leaves them out of the grant process. It's and like they're the, the ones that, that need the money the most. The most. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's so frustrating. It's, um, it's sort of self-fulfilling because by requiring this big match, the organizations that really need the money can't do it. So you've got the same pool of people oftentimes that keep getting the big grants. Yeah, the big dogs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's frustrating. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we've already highlighted quite a few challenges of, of grant writing and, um, you know, 
there's so much that goes into it. But um, are there any other kind of like surprise challenges or things that maybe um, Afma didn't realize were going to be a barrier or any other tidbits of piece of advice in the application phase? We're going to talk more about implementation once you've received the funds. But any other thing that somebody considering um, applying for a grant for their market might want to consider? Yeah, I think one of the things I learned when reviewing is how unclear the application actually is so that of how, where you're supposed to put answers and how long they're supposed to be and what it looks like. I, When I was doing reviewing, I was surprised by how differently people approach the application and what they wrote, what they wrote for like what their narrative should be of what their project is. And so Again, that's why I think it's a really good idea to get exposure to what people's applications actually look like and ask people, um, can you share your application with me? Can I see it? Um, Because there were some people in my room, some applicants who didn't even write a narrative. And I realized looking at the application, it's actually not clear that you're supposed to put a whole section here of what your your project is about. Um, uh, and then another thing that I wouldn't have known um, if Kelly hadn't shared this was that like while the actual application form has a page limit, you can attach as many attachments as you want. And those attachments can be as long as you want them to be. Um, so you can add in all kinds of other information there. And so when you're doing like your partner letters, um, first of all, you should write them yourself. <laughs> That helps your partners get them done quickly, but it also means you can write all kinds of cool things about yourself in there and um, and about your partner and why 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 they're such a great why they're going to do so much great work for this and how important that um, relationship between you and and them is. Um, but yeah, those attachments um, you can you can just share so much more in them, and um, if you don't know that. Um, I think people miss miss that chance to add inf- more information about what they're doing there. And then you just hope you don't get that one reviewer that wants you to be short and concise, right? <laughs> it's like you got the judge that didn't have breakfast that morning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bad news. Well, so once you've applied for a grant, how long did it take you to um, find out, Amanda, how long, whether or not you got the award? Yeah, I think so we were – the most recent one was the 2021 year, and I think USDA was a little bit behind. They were, you know, the grant is supposed to start October 1st, and we were well into October before they made the announcements of who had gotten grants that year. Um, so I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Like, I, they must, you know, their fiscal year starts October 1st, so they must be wanting to let people usually know by September, I would think. And, and this year, the grants are due beginning of May. So there's definitely a few months wait. Um, so that's a little nerve wracking, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What yeah. do you do? Yeah. You like take <laughs> a long nap. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then once you've been awarded a grant, what are the next steps? Do you have to do, I mean, they tell you you've got it. Do you have to submit documents that say, yes, we accept this and on these terms and, you know, is there a timeline you have to agree to that kind of thing? Yeah. There's some official paperwork, your contract or whatnot that you have to sign and um the year the last year we we did it they were also setting up this new payment system called the payment management system and getting getting that going was a little <laughs> a bit of a trial both um for us and be, and for for the USDA because it was a new thing for them hopefully it's easier now that they had it for a couple years and we we do our payments on a reimbursement system so it wasn't like um we got our grant approved and then we got all the money right away we have to make expenses and then periodically request reimbursements yeah that was one of our big questions is um how long does it take to receive the funds do you have to spend the money first and then get reimbursed or do you have a, do they start you out with kind of an initial pool of funds to draw from to do the work that you've proposed <laughs> um yeah, no, we do it on the reimbursement way. So we um, make the expenses first and then ask, then we submit um, submit a bunch of them and then they send us the money. Um, that payment management system, though, once it's set up, we are actually getting the money within like 24 hours of making the request, 
which is a big difference from our previous grant, which could take 10 days or, or more or like emailing, like, did you get my request? Is it coming? <laughs> kind of stuff happened a lot. Um, uh, but I think you can do it the other way of asking for the money first. But there is like this, like if you don't actually spend the money after they've given it to you within like a certain number of out, like 24 hours or something, then like you have to give it back. And so I think we've like avoid, I mean, we've never tried it that way. We've only ever done the reimbursement so, um, way of doing it. So, yeah, I'm just getting familiar with some of that because USDA did a, a workshop at our conference about grant and funding. And so they gave us money to reserve that spot so that they could get exposure to people. But and then it, I mean, we hadn't even applied for a grant. <laughs> we, and all of a sudden there were 17 forms with different numbers. And it was like ignore form number B2762 because that was last year. Use form number B3741. Oh and it's just mind boggling. And I would imagine, again, really small organizations or emerging organizations that don't have all this financial background are just going to be overwhelmed by this stuff. And, and again, those are the folks that need it the most. So it's it's frustrating. Do you... Is it you personally, or do you establish some kind of implementation team that's responsible for tracking these expenditures and getting them on the right forms and getting them to the right person at USDA? Uh, no, it's it's me. It's you. Uh, okay, you're the team. All right. <laughs> yeah, it's me. I mean, it's my my team at Afma, me and um, Ashley and Madeline. We all work together to get these things done. Um, and we do have... Um, some contracted bookkeeping help. Um, and we have, you know, QuickBooks and we have systems in place. Um, so I think we are better set up than some of the farmers markets or farms than I, that I've seen, um, which is another reason to like, if you're a big or if you're an association or a big organization, like I see part of your role in getting these FMPP grants is to get some of this money to part of what your project should be is giving, sending this money further on to the farmer's market or to whatever your network of people that you work with is. Um, some of the money for this grant is just like, we wanted to get it to farmer's markets in Oregon. And I think it's better if my time is better spent working on this, like accounting stuff and asking for reimbursements and doing stuff like that, rather than like the smaller farmer's markets or farms. Um, it makes more sense for me to be doing that than them. And so I think making partnerships and getting this money further out is a really important um, role that should pe larger organizations should feel obligated to do, I think. Yeah, that's a really good answer for some of the barriers that, that the whole process creates for smaller groups is if larger groups or associations or state groups do get the funds, but with the idea that they can share, because your your grant, for instance, that I'm working with you on now is um, one that provides education to 10 different market cohorts, some of whom are really, really tiny organizations. And I just can't imagine that they would have had the capacity to apply for a grant themselves to do, you know, learn how to do vendor training or market manager training or that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, they um, yeah, I think we can really see that our getting this funding is making a big difference for those markets that are getting this from us and them not having to spend a bunch of extra time um, filling out an SF270 form or whatnot. Yeah. I'm really glad love, we're not doing that. Love that form. Love that form. <laughs> is that your favorite form? That's my favorite form. <laughs> of all the forms? Uh, of all the forms. I hate forms. I hate <laughs> grant administration. It's absolutely the worst. Even the little tiny slice that I'm doing. And um, I admire you for how well you do your job, Amanda. I would not want to be doing it. You're doing a great job of it. Uh, is there anything that you've learned from the experience of receiving a grant and having to management th that you think would be important for applicants to know? Like, is there, when you're thinking about applying for a grant, should you be aware that it's going to take this kind of scale or this kind of bandwidth to be able to administer it once you get it? Um, when you're, when you make, when you're making your grant, yeah, maybe putting some time in there for some, if you don't have like bookkeeping help, putting in time for consulting, making sure that these grant funders know that like administering their grant takes takes staff time and effort and that you're putting that in there to cover that um don't be afraid don't i think a lot of people like 
they want to save the funders money or something and they don't include their own like they want to they they short shorten themselves on like paying themselves in their own time and don't do that put you know pay your own get your own salary in there um and your own hours don't short shift that um what else I think that's a really, really good point. I mean, that's – and honestly, that starts at the vendor level of farmer's markets where we have to keep reminding people, plan to pay yourself when you're figuring out how to price your product. You can't yeah. produce that product without paying yourself. Sweat equity you know, only goes so far. And I think the same thing is here. And it's perfectly legit to include staff time for grant administration in the grant. What you can't include in a grant – um, you can't use grant funds to pay somebody to write your grant for you. And a lot of people don't seem aware of that. So we'll see every once in a while people that pop up and say, oh, I'll write your grant for you. You don't have to pay me now. I'll j- I get a percentage of the grant when you get it. That's not actually kosher. Um, if the USDA knows you're doing that, that's that's not good. Um, so you do have to be able to advance the money for a helper or a consultant, somebody with expertise to help you write that grant. You can't take it out of grant funds. It's gotta That money's got to come from somewhere else. And you would think that the folks that are reviewing the grants or, you know, deciding whether or not someone's getting a grant, if you if they have a grant and you're not writing the cost of your admin or your own salary into that grant, if I were reviewing that, I would say they're going to have a hard time executing this True. and using the funds appropriately and doing what they're saying they're going to do if they are not building that staff time into it. Because how can you possibly get that done if no one's being paid to do it? So I think to your point, it's important to just be honest about the work it's going to take. And, yeah, take somebody to, you know, do the function of the grant. So just write that in there into the grant. So I think that's an important tip for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's not helping you in terms of getting approved by <laughs> yeah. pretending that it's not going to take no, It's I can, okay. It's we don't need that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can see how some people would think that. Like, sure. oh, you're giving us money. It shouldn't be going to me because it's going to the function of the grant. But – that's really, you function. can't execute yeah. the function of the grant unless you're giving somebody yeah. money to to do that admin work. So, yeah, good. That was a great tip. I think people don't realize that. So, awesome. yeah. So, Amanda, before we go, what's next for Ofma? What are you guys doing? Do you have you know? You said you're planning on applying not this current grant, but the following year. So, so what's on the horizon horizon for your organization? Yeah, I think yeah. This fall, we're going to start dreaming up, um, talking about Ofma is also in the process of doing our next strategic plan for the next five years. So this, these two things are coming in, um, really good timing because again, as I said, don't change your thing to fit a grant. So we're, we're looking at what it is that we want to be doing and then look at how, like our, how FMPP funding could do that. Um, but we've been very focused on market managers, market staff, the people who run farmers markets. I think that's a lot of me because that's where <laughs> I came from and the people I really wanted to create community with. Um, and we haven't been doing as much providing um, training directly to vendors. And so I think we want to start looking at that more um, and maybe bringing in someone who's more like expertise in talking to vendors on that. Um, and just where, like, yeah, where do we want our next, and where do we want this next step of what do farm, what do farmers markets want from us? Probably doing some more polling of what what our farmers markets want from us as far as training and what they're looking for. Um, yeah, I think yeah, just expanding our programs and seeing seeing where we can take things. Um, yeah, I think you've got exciting stuff ahead. Um, anything we should have asked you that we didn't? Anything you want to share? Oh, yeah. I think I, I want to say there's a, great, there's a great workshop out there that the Wallace Center did with um, Daisa Enterprises this past summer. On, like, it was like sub- subverting the colonial origins of federal grants. Um, I think the, the workshop was called Making Grants Ours. And really, you guys, they should be your next great, your next guests on this topic. They did such a wonderful job and really connecting, um, you know, why these grants are the way they are and how they have been unfair and how if you are coming from um, uh, underserved background of like the way this money was not put in place to work for you and why. So 
think it makes people who feel like well, all these barriers are like very validating about why these barriers are there and how to get a, get around them. Mm, interesting. That's great insight. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. We'll make sure that we include that in the show notes too, so that our uh, listeners can find it. Yeah, for sure. It's been a pleasure, Amanda. Yeah, as always. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for listening today, and big thanks to our sponsor, Grapevine Local Food Marketing for helping markets, farmers, and food makers, and for supporting Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast. Learn more about the, how they can help with your marketing projects and your value-added producer grant application by clicking the Grapevine Local Food Marketing logo on the resource page at FarmersMarketPros.com. Farmer's Markets are all about connection, and all of us, operators, farmers, and vendors, keep learning. Connect with people just like you from various parts of the country and share what's happening in your area in the terrific conversations over in our private Facebook group, the Farmer's Market Pros Community. If you're actively involved in a farmer's market, please find us there, answer the three qualifying questions, and join the group. You can also message us on Instagram at Farmer's Market Pros or email us at connect at farmersmarketpros.com. If you're looking for further education, check out our online course offerings at FarmersMarketPros.com. Thanks for listening to Tent Talk. Please leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you access your podcasts and tell us and others how you're enjoying Tent Talk. And be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss the next episode. Tent Talk, the Farmers Market Podcast, is proudly produced by Farmers Market Pros, where passion meets profit. Today's episode was recorded and edited by Justine Marzoni Mead. Original music by David Mead. Thank you so much for listening today, and we'll have another great episode next week, so tune in.